I guess we can get started, huh? All right, cool. Okay, we're back to galaxies. Um, I know you all are excited. Uh, so we're giving you sort of like uh, scale whiplash from like planets to cosmology. So yeah, we're gonna we're gonna continue on kind of uh, where we where we left off last time. And um, in this lecture, so we go back to this picture slide here, right? Uh, last time we kind of talked about the cosmo cosmology side of galaxies, and in this lecture we're we're kind of kind of going to go through this stuff. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move down to try to understand uh, how and where do stars form in galaxies, and what are the processes that are governing uh, how many stars form uh, within within galaxies and what they do over time. Okay. So the first question you can ask, and so last time we put together this, you know, pretty nifty story about starting from the Big Bang and all the perturbations and everything, and they all grow beautifully, and somehow, magically, we get disks and ellipticals, and it all works, right? And so you can ask the question, well, you know, can we form realistic galaxies just from this story, right? And we'll go through it again in a minute. And what I mean by realistic galaxies is... Um, you know, produce the kind of things that we see in the real universe. So one of the things that we see about the galaxy population, uh, which was noticed all the way back, you know, in the 1920s by Hubble, is that galaxies come in different flavors, right? And particularly, you can roughly categorize them into ellipticals and spirals. Okay, Hubble talked about barred spirals versus not barred spirals. We won't discuss that here. Um, interesting, but but not not relevant for this particular talk. Um, so, now of course Hubble was just doing that based on the pictures. So he went, he went out, you know, took, a, took an image of, gal of various galaxies, you know, the same sort of galaxies that he was using to measure cosmological expansion and, and find Hubble's law and all this kind of stuff. But he noticed that they, were, they came in all these, si these shapes, but what's cool about the Hubble uh, classification scheme in the Hubble sequence, why it's survived to this day is because these morph this morphology actually correlates very strongly with many other properties of galaxies, right? For instance, these elliptical type of galaxies tend to have old stars and very little ongoing new star formation, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> and so they're red, right? Remember, you remember from Camilla's talk this morning that if you uh, don't have if you have uh, young stars, they're very blue and hot, but they also die off very quickly, right? So you won't see them anymore, right? So if you all you see are the old stars, then you know that you don't have any. Um, you, all, you, you know, all you see is a red galaxy. You know, you only have old stars. There's very little gas or dust. Uh, there's actually a lot of hot gas, but not a lot of cool gas in the galaxy. Um, these things tend to be dispersion supported, so they they look like blobs. Right? So all the, you have all these stars whizzing around, just like the dark matter, uh, mostly not colliding with each other. Uh, they tend to live in des dense environments, and they tend to have very large black holes relative to their stellar mass, compared to spiral galaxies. Right? So they're, they're, we have young stars. They tend to be bluer, perhaps only in the spiral arms, have cool gas, dust, rotation supported, and live in less dense environments with smaller black holes like the Milky Way. Okay. So the question is, you know, if, if we want to understand galaxy formation, we have to understand not only, you know, how these galaxies, how these disks form and how they turn into ellipticals, but can we get this full diversity and can we produce all these properties that are associated with that kind of, with these morphological uh, types. And so, you know, again, the, the sort of scenario we outlined last time, just to kind of uh, um, encapsulate it, is captured in these things called semi-analytic models, okay? And so the idea of a semi-analytic model is the following. Let's start with a dark matter distribution, a dark matter uh, simulation, let's say, like this. And we know that the dark matter halos grow hierarchically. So you form a bunch of small halos very early on, and then as you go over through time, those halos merge together, so on and so forth, to get bigger and bigger things. So you can create something called a merger tree, okay? So in other words, this is what a merger tree looks like. So the, this is early times. This is, you know, the galaxy today. And this galaxy, that, that, uh, this halo that we see today actually formed 
from a whole bunch of small units that merge, so on and so forth. And we know that when galaxies sort of grow, uh, you know, without merging, they form a disk, right? You, everything collapses down into a disk. So as long as it's doing something like this, this little green disk part here will grow and grow and grow. However, once you have a merger, right, we know the mergers kill the disks. So we can reset this clock effectively, and if two things merge, we say, oh, we form an elliptical, get rid of the disk. But of course, the disk can regrow if there's more gas. We saw an example of that last time. Eventually, you end up with something that merges and comes up with an elliptical. OK, so, so that's the idea. Um, you can create you know, very nice large-scale structure from this. So for instance, there's a nice little image from uh, uh, Gabriela de Lucia's work where um, you know, this, is, this is real data, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the 2DF survey. And these are mocks from large n-body simulations populated with galaxies using this scheme, OK? Uh, plus some other parameters, so on and so forth. Then you see the galaxy distribution on large scale. So each tiny point here is a galaxy in redshift space. So this is looking out from us here, you know, in, in both angle and, and uh, velocity, recession velocity. And they look very, very similar. And it even, you know, if you track the star formation, you can say that these dense regions are full of these red elliptical-like galaxies and the filament structures, you know, the, are, are more, uh, have more of the blue star forming galaxy. So that's really good, right? That, that sounds like it all makes sense. But does it actually? And the answer is not only no, but hell no. OK? There, this is actually, this thing looks nothing like real galaxies. OK, why? Two big problems, OK? The first, so they're illustrated in these two plots, What's being plotted here is a famous plot, often called the Medal plot or the Medal Lily plot, which is the star formation rate density versus cosmic time. Okay? So what you try to go out and do observationally is literally go out and measure galaxies, you know, catalog galaxies at a variety of redshifts, so a variety of cosmic times, and measure the star formation rate in each one, add those up, and come up with a star formation rate density, so solar masses per year per cubic megaparsec, co-moving co megaparsec. And that's those, those data points here. This is from Madow and Dickinson's review in 2014. There's actually more data than this, but for our purposes, this will suffice. This green line shows a simulation in this case where all we included was what I've told you about so far. And you can see it's way, way above the line. Right. So, <clears throat> so that's known as the overcooling problem. That if you just let cooling run away and pile up a whole bunch of gas into galaxies, it will happily form into a whole bunch of stars. And that's way more stars than we actually see in the universe. I mean, it's better than being less. If it was less, we'd be in trouble. But, it, but if it's more, that tells us that there is something holding star formation back that we haven't accounted for. The second problem is known as the angular momentum problem, OK? And essentially, uh, that's kind of illustrated in this plot. What this is, is a plot, is a histogram of kappa rote. So kappa, what is kappa rote? Kappa rote is the fraction of support coming from rotation. So if you Im imagine you have a thin disk that's completely rotationally supported, kappa rote would be 1. But if you, have a dis if you have a bulge, no disk at all, then kappa rote would be 0, right? It's purely dispersion supported. So that's, these are bulges, pure bulges, or, or ellipticals, and these are, these are disks. If you look at galaxies, and you know, like uh, different morphological types in the Hubble sequence, like SA, SB, you know, Milky Way is sort of SBC type galaxy here, these are the kind of values of, of kappa rote you get, half and above, right? This simulation all produces this distribution of kappa rote, OK? In other words, it's very hard to predict. I mean, look at the frequency of the Milky Way, SBC. A, a Milky Way should be a super rare object in this model, right? Well, we know it's not. There's a lot of things like the Milky Way around, right? And certainly, if you go out to SDs or stuff, or even you know, something like that, there's just none of them in this type of model. OK, so why is, so it's, it's even worse than that, right? And so going, just going a little more into the first problem, the overcooling problem, 
right? A good way to depict this is what's um, kind of one of the most important plots in, in sort of global galaxy formation theory, which is this plot of what's called the cosmic star formation efficiency, or some people call it the conversion efficiency. What it is, is a plot of the stellar to halo mass ratio, okay? So the, you take a galaxy halo and you say, you know, what's the mass of stars in that halo divided by the total mass of the halo, including everything. And you plot that versus halo mass, right? And um, now, if halos were somehow magically instantly efficient at putting everything into stars, remember that halos have this magic number of this cosmic baryon fraction in them, right, about 0.16. So if you instantly turned all those baryons into stars, your efficiency would be 0.16. So that's kind of the upper limit, right? You can't get above a 0.16. But in fact, there's a little bit, it's a little bit more than that, right, because you have to get the g gas not from just the outside, you have to get it way down into the galaxy, right? And um, I won't go into this derivation, but it's a, it's a pretty simple derivation, right? The, the dynamical time of a halo, right, is 1 over square root of g rho, roughly, right? This rho is the mean density within the halo. It turns out that for halos, right, for virialized halos, this mean density is approximately equal to 200 times the critical density at that redshift, which is about equal to 200 times the critical density at redshift zero times one plus z cubed, right? Because the density just scales with, with the universe cosmic expansion, one plus z cubed. So, so that's rho, right? So then when I can put this in, you know, this is a, just a number. This is just a number. It's the critical density at redshift zero, right? G is just a number. So I can calculate what this is. It's about 2.5 uh, gig years times 1 plus z. There's this 1 plus z factor cubed, square root. It's in the denominator, so it's minus 3 half, right? It turns out that a Hubble time, again, very approximately, okay, this is... I'm playing fast and loose here with cosmology a bit. But um, roughly a Hubble time is something like 14 gig years times 1 plus z to the minus 3 half. That power is strictly only true in the matter-dominated era. Once you get to lambda-dominated, it's a little different. But let's not worry about these complications. Okay? So you can immediately see that the dynamical time is a fixed fraction of the Hubble time. And this is independent of mass and independent of redshift. So the dynamical time over a Hubble time is something like 20%. What does that mean for stuff for this? Well, it means that there's, you know, you expect about 20% of the gas in the halo to be in transit down, right? And 80% of it should be in the galaxy. Well, even if it gets in the galaxy, it doesn't instantly form into stars. It takes some time to form into stars, right? That takes roughly another 20%. I won't, that's a longer thing. You have to use a Kennecott schmidt roll and all that. But in, in essence, what you get is that even accounting for infall and star formation time, you should still have about you know, uh, more than 50%, something like 60 70% of your baryons should be in stars. You know, it's, it's essentially all the baryons minus the stuff falling in minus the time it takes to, to convert it from the galaxy, in the galaxy. And it wouldn't be dependent on mass. So that's that line up here. So this shows you this overcooling problem, right? This is way above all of this. So what's this? This is essentially empirical determinations of this relation from observed galaxies. Right. So this is a very bad match, OK? So there's two things about this. One is that the peak efficiency here Instead of being 10%, it's only about 3%, okay? But even worse than that, there's this very strong mass dependence. So there's a peak that happens to be a little pretty close to the Milky Way, not coincidentally, actually. Um, but then it's very much less efficient to low masses and also less efficient to high masses, okay? So clearly, you know, this simple model is, is just way off base, 
right? There's, there's a bunch of extra ingredients, at least one extra ingredient here that we need. So let's discuss the angular momentum problem as well, okay? So very briefly, what's going on there? Again, qualitatively, right? We know spirals merge to grow bulges. We talked about this last time. Well, it turns out that, this, that the merger rate, the galaxy merger rate, or the halo merger rate, is a very strong function of redshift. Why is that? Well, it's kind of pretty simple, really. The early universe is compact. So things are closer together. So things merge more. Okay, really, it's pretty much that simple. Okay? So the merger rate is a very strong function of... Of, uh, and, and people argue what this exponent is. You know, a simple model would say it's 1 plus z cubed. It's just some density thing. Um, but, you know, okay, maybe it, this is observations, essentially, of merger rates for, you know, uh, it's hard to actually determine what is actually a merger, but under some set of assumptions, that's what you get. Okay. The point is, there's a huge number of mergers early on. So that means that you have all this stuff falling in, it's not like falling in into a disk, because every time you think you can settle into the disk, you're gonna, you know, the mergers are so frequent, you're just going to get whapped into an elliptical. And therefore, your bulge is going to grow very, very rapidly. So you can see where this angular momentum problem comes from. Right? It comes from the fact that because of these early mergers, we've grown the bulge so big that we can't actually form things like SC and SZD galaxies anymore that have small bulges today. Right? Because once you form a bulge, how do you get rid of it? Right? The bulge is there, it's just sitting there down in the center. You can't do much to get rid of a bulge. So, so you know, uh, you know, this is also illustrate, can be illustrated in simulations. Um, so this, for instance, shows the specific angular momentum versus the rotation velocity for, for disk galaxies. Uh, this is what you get for halos. This is this lambda parameter, right? This is what real galaxies look like. They're pretty close to the halos. So galaxies have mostly conserved their angular momentum, specific angular momentum when coming down. This is what you get when you run full hydro simulations with mergers and everything like that. So this is, this is why it's called the angular momentum problem. Okay. So, so these are the two main problems. And fortunately, they, they might, in fact, they probably do, have one solution. Okay, one size fits all, and this is galactic feedback. Okay, so this is kind of the, you know, um, sort of what, what people think a lot about today. So how, how does feedback regulate galaxies? And there's kind of two types of feedback in this world, right? Um, there's the kind of feedback, which you call ejective feedback, right? Um, ejective feedback is like the gas gets into the ISM, but then somehow is chucked out, right? It's kind of like the bouncer at the club, right? You get in the club, chucked out. Um, versus preventive feedback, or velvet rope feedback, you never get in the club in the first place, okay? So how do these two kind of things happen? Well, you know, this could be some explosive event, for instance. So you get in the galaxy, but some explosion pu pushes you back out, this could be that, you know, it, remember, in order to get in the club, you have to cool. You have to have this, this radiative cooling uh, that, that allows you to condense down, right? Well, suppose there was some mechanism that was counteracting that and kept the gas hot when it was trying to cool, right? Then that would be your, bound, your velvet rope, rope feedback, right? You can't get in. So both of these things, of course, require energy. Right? And that's the key thing, is, you know, we know gravity happens, we know cooling happens, so we can't stop those, right? But we, so we're going to have to add something in order to, you know, make, make all this overcooling go away. Now, a good way to illustrate this, and, and kind of an equivalent way to illustrate this to this stellar, uh, you know, this cosmic star formation efficiency I showed you in a minute, is with the, the mass function. So this is a plot of a mass function for, for halos. Now, remember, we derived this, well, we didn't, sorry, we didn't derive it, but I, I showed you the equation for this. This is the press schecter mass function I talked about earlier, uh, last time, with the slope of minus 1.8 here, and then there's some exponential cutoff way over here, okay? This is what you actually measure for the stellar galaxy, uh, stellar mass function of galaxies, right? So this is the number density of galaxies per mass spin, okay? 
That's what a stellar mass function is, or, or a mass function in general. So this is the halo mass function. This is the, halo, the dotted line here is the halo mass function times 0.16. So if everything was maximally efficient, that would, it would be there. And you clearly see that you need a lot of feedback at low masses you can, you can, to make stars very inefficient there. And you need a lot of feedback at high masses. And you need at least some feedback in the middle. Right? But this is nice, because if the feedback is particularly small, especially in these galaxies, Right? Remember, early galaxies that are doing all this merging and everything like that, right, those galaxies are all tiny. Suppose we managed to prevent those things from forming stars in the first place. Then it wouldn't grow a bulge, right? because the bulge is made of stars. So if those little tiny things that are merging no longer have stars anymore, then you've solved the, also solved the angular momentum problem, because right? you, you don't grow a, fast, a big bulge. So both of these things can be solved by feedback. The question is, where is the energy coming from? Right? Well, <clears throat> so you start looking around for explosions right, that happen in galaxies. And you know, again, you heard about this from Camilla this morning. Right? The most obvious thing is supernovae. Right? You see supernovae, boom, they go off. Each one releases up the order of 10 to the 51 ergs of energy per supernova. Okay, so kind of a, a canonical number. Um, and <clears throat> what's interesting about this, right, is that the supernova rate is going to be, of course, proportional to the star formation rate, because you, know, you have a bunch of stars forming. You'll have some segment of them that are the high mass stars that go supernovae, and that segment is kind of fixed, you know, some fixed fraction, assuming a fixed stellar initial mass function. Okay. So which itself is proportional to the gas infall rate because the star formation is being driven by the gas coming in. Okay? So that means that as you have a bunch of gas infalling, the supernova is able to essentially proportionally provide energy to that gas. And if you think about it, that essentially means that you can heat the gas to some specific some temperature. Right? Because for every, every amount of gas you did, you have a certain amount of energy. That allows you to get a certain specific energy, which is a temperature, effectively. So there's this, there's this, so the supernovae can heat gas. So you know, here's all these supernovae going, going on, right? Gas comes in, it heats the gas and sort of pushes it back out, you know, out of the galaxy. And you see, you know, you see these kinds of things in the real universe as well. So this T supernovae, right, which is this kind of value, right? If this value, if this, if this um, uh, temperature is greater than the virial temperature. Right? So if you heat the gas that's infalling to hotter than the, than the temperature that, uh, at which the halo can bind it anymore, you'll actually get rid of the gas. Right? The gas will literally evaporate out of the halo. And of course, that will then prevent star formation because there'll be no gas falling in. Right? So you know, it, this is a very simplistic model. Dekel and Silk had a very influential paper where they computed through its, you know, it's, it's one of those classic papers where they made a huge number of completely wrong assumptions and somehow got pretty much the right answer. Okay, um, so they they computed this this uh, supernova temperature is around a few times ten to the five Kelvin, right? So this is the corresponds to the virial temperature for a mass halo mass of around ten to the ten solar masses, right? So the Milky Way would not be able to you know, supernova energy, you know, remember its virial temperature is more like a couple times 10 to the 6. So the, so the supernova no, would not be able to unbind the, the, you know, in this simplistic model. In reality, it, you know, it provides some thing, but, but. So the point is, that star forming, the supernova feedback is most effective, and in fact is preferentially effective in the low mass galaxies, right? And that, fortunately, is exactly what we wanted. Right? We wanted all these low-mass galaxies to be much, much more suppressed. And as we move towards higher masses, we, you know, the supernova become less effective because the supernova temperature becomes comparable to or even exceeding the virial temperature. Right? And then you, then you reduce your effectiveness. So that's, that's really exactly what we like. OK, so that sounds, all, again, one of those cases where, yeah, that's great. And everybody thinks this is all solved and stuff like that until people actually thought about it for more than five seconds. right? And then they realize this doesn't work at all. So why doesn't it work at all? Well, I mean, you, know, you don't have to think about anything but just you know, simple physics or, or you know, movies. right? 
you have like a movie, an explosion goes off in a movie, right, down, down like Indiana Jones or something like that. Where does the explosion go? Well, the explosion goes down the tunnels. It doesn't go spherically outward into the rock of the cave, right? It goes through whatever's the path of least resistance and blows out, right? Well, that's actually not that helpful, if you think about it, because what we really want to do is we want to get rid of all this gas, but if the, if the supernova can just find some channel and vent out that way, it's not going to do much to most of the gas. And in fact, this is exactly the problem that people have had since you know, the very first simulations of these were done in the late 90s. Right? People said, well, you know, this is a nice idea, but this doesn't work at all. Right? And frankly, to this day, the situation hasn't changed much. Okay, but all kinds of things have been, have been uh, added to these models to try to help the supernovae be effective, right? Um, one of the things that you can, uh, you know, not sure how much stellar evolution you covered last time, but stars also have stellar winds, which can be fairly energetic. Uh, so you can add that in. Uh, you can add radiation pressure from the stars. That's another thing that could help you out a little bit, just the UV photons from the young stars. Um, Another thing that kind of helps you out a little bit is the fact that supernovae don't go out instantaneously. The, the, the star can wander off a little bit before going supernovae, and this can allow it to go in off in a less dense region, which allows it to be more effective. Uh, then you can try to, you know, uh, do the what about magnetic fields thing, right? And, and so then you have uh, other things that you can try. So essentially, you know, this is one of the a simulation, which I'll, I'll show you the movie of here. You know, this one is basically, I think, this is the most, you know, uh, the, the silk simulations by, uh, 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 by Steffi Walsh and company are some of the most advanced ones. It's including all of these things, effectively. And <clears throat> what this is, what this simulation is showing, is just a piece of a disk, a galactic disk. You want to get really high resolution, so you're not going to model the whole galaxy. You can't do that. You're going to model, just imagine a galactic disk here. We're going to model a tiny column of it, okay? vertically, and we're going to see, let's put out, blow up a whole bunch of supernovae in here and see how much gas we can escape vertically out of the disk, right? So let's see what it looks like. And these are just various quantities here. So here comes the gas collapsing, and you're going to start to see, you know, the, the uh, supernovae go off, right? Oh, sorry, these are the stars forming. And now you can start to see those go supernovae and start venting off the gas, right? Uh, so this is following all kinds. Here's the magnetic field, for instance. Here's cosmic ray pressure. Here's the temperature of the gas. So you're starting to heat it up to, you know, in some cases as hot as 10 to the 7 Kelvin. Uh, all kinds of craziness going on, right? The stars are wandering around, um, so on and so forth, right? So you can, you can get these fairly high velocity outflows, but the, the problem continues to be that basically, if you think about it, you know, we needed factors of you know, over 10 in suppression uh, for this cosmic star formation efficiency, which means that I need to throw out 10 times as much gas as I'm putting into stars in order to you know, get that strong turndown in the, in the efficiency. This thing, even this thing with everything included, does not do more than one or two, right? And this is really optimistic conditions. So here's a huge problem that people haven't solved yet in galaxy formation. We, need, we seem to need you know, all this um, uh, amazing amount of, of you know, energy being deposited and, and throwing stuff out of galaxies. Um, maybe part of the solution is the velvet rope side, the feedback stuff, because one of the things is that you know, this, as you, as you kind of saw it, you can get quite hot gas, so maybe that, that you can, instead of just kicking it out, you can also heat the gas outside, and that can help a little bit. Turns out, still not quite enough, right? So, so you can't get the required mass loss at sufficiently high velocities to blow it out of the galaxy, right? So that's kind of how uh, the, the, uh, the situation is. On the other hand, right, we can still try to do this in a cosmological setting, uh, just making some assumptions. Um, and typically, by, by assumption, what I mean is a cheat. Okay? So every, every cosmological model that tries to use supernova feedback, which is pretty much all of them, to suppress the low mass end of the, the mass function, uh, uses some kind of cheat. Okay? So I'm just going to show you a couple of these. Right? This, is a knee, this is called the Niihau simulation. Uh, the, the, um, uh, which basically, uh, it, what it does is finds a supernova, 
all right? Each supernova goes off. It heats the gas surrounding the supernovae. But then, right, if you just let the, let the code do its thing, all that heat, would, because it's so dense, would immediately radiate away and wouldn't get any pressure. So instead, they do a cheat where they turn off cooling. So we're just going to say cooling doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I'm going to shut that off for a while because what that does, of course, is it pressurizes the gas. And then it's able to drive a spherical outflow much better, right? Okay, that's great. Um, the fire simulations tried other things. They include this radiation pressure and cosmic rays, but they really sort of push things to very favorable parameters, right? So I think, well, I kind of showed this one already, but this time you can sort of see, uh, you know, there's, there's all this gas coming in. This is just showing the gas density here. And you can really see uh, all these sort of bubbles that are going off. Uh, it's a little hard to see here, but, but that, that are just the supernovae. So you see very early on, you don't form any bulge because there's so many supernovae going off that's blowing stuff out, right? You only start to form a bulge here fairly late on when you get a nice order rotation, so on and so forth, right? And there's that merger that sort of regrew the disk, so on and so forth, right? So here's, you know, there's another big merger here, and you can see you form a little bar. You want to know how to form bars? That's how to form bars, right? You sort of have a, have a nice merger there. Um, so, but it's even more dramatic in fire. So let's, you can now see the fire simulation over here. This is in, co in physical coordinates, so it's expanding with the universe. And this thing is really uh, quite dramatic, right? So this is a, a co color-coded by temperature. So you can really see the hot gas that's being driven. Here's a little merging event that comes around. The gas comes in, stimulates a whole bunch of star formation that creates a bunch of blowout, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the star formation is quite bursty. See, so by late times here, you form a nice disk in this model. But here, still, a redshift one and a half, you know, you're barely forming any kind of a, you know, bulge or anything like that, or even not even that much ordered rotation, uh, so on and so forth. And only sort of at redshift one, you start to actually, and you can still see the supernovae going off. Now, what's interesting about this is you, get, you can see some of these supernovae go off, but you see, because this galaxy is now more massive, the supernovae don't get anywhere. Right? It's that Decalin silk thing, right? Yeah, there's still oh, there's a big supernova event, but still, it, it wasn't able to blow things out, right? Because this thing is now kind of above that threshold, where where you just can't get rid of the gas anymore very effectively. Uh, nonetheless, you can sort of keep the gas hot a little bit. You see the hot surrounding gas, uh, and that kind of helps you uh, stop the star formation. So both of these things. So this 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 uh, shows the the low mass half of that cosmic star formation efficiency plot below around 10 to the 12. And you see all these galaxies lie along those, that, that relation. So they all match the data, but they all do it with some, some level of cheating. Romeo, I have a yeah. question here. Yeah. Sorry, I'm interrupting you there. Yeah. Um, so why is it not enough that we just disturb the gas so much that it doesn't clump anymore to form stars? This is not sufficient. You, you have made the point many times, right? You, you, you need to blow the gas away Yes. Um, so there's no way that you can just heat it up or smooth it out, and that would do the job of damping star formation? Right. So, I mean, the, the problem is uh, that, you know, if you, if you ask the question, what's, well, what's the gravitational dynamical time in the disk, right? It's tiny compared to co cosmological scales. So even if you smoothed everything out, you know, you have any kind of perturbation it will collapse on a, a, a dynamical, um, you know, a, a disk dynamical time, which is maybe 100 million years, right? But we need to, you know, we need to prevent star formation. We need to suppress star formation much more long-term than that is the problem, right? Um, so that's, that's really the issue with that. Um, as far as keeping it hot or keeping, you know, one thing people have talked about a lot, particularly for the low-mass galaxies, is... Um, you know, suppose you could keep the galaxy in H1 instead of H2, right? Uh, H1, much more difficult to form stars They're out of molecular gas, so you keep it atomic. Um, what you have to do is roughly keep it, you know, at temperatures above 1,000 Kelvin, roughly, okay? So you can, that's the idea, you sort of keep it warm, and it doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, do that. Two problems with that. One, yes, we see increased atomic hydrogen in low-mass galaxies, but not that much, right? We don't see, you know, uh, enough to make up that difference where we, we can just, you know, say that, okay, all of it went into H1 instead of into stars. 
Um, so observationally, that's kind of ruled out. But also, uh, the question then is, it's very, like, how do you arrange to put it only to keep it that temperature, exactly that temperature, and no, you know, and, and do it very uniformly? It's a weird thing, right? Um, so, yeah, it's just very hard to arrange. Um, okay, so, <clears throat> right. So, so we seem to need this stellar feedback, right? And the models say we need this stellar feedback, but maybe the models are just crap, right? Maybe, maybe we're just completely barking up the wrong tree, right? So what would really be nice is if we could actually observe feedback and see, see does feedback actually, you know, do we see this feedback in galaxies? And the answer is yes, uh, we do, uh, but it's hard, right? Um, so I, whenever people talk about uh, feedback in galaxies, they always show a picture of M82. So M82 is a nearby starburst galaxy, and you know you can study it very nicely, and you know all kinds of different things. This is Hubble. This is James. Uh, yeah, this is James Webb, right in the central region. So you know optical infrared. The red stuff is actually um, uh, uh, mid infrared uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. If you don't know what that is, good for you. Um, so. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, essentially, you know, this is great. The reason why everyone always shows this one galaxy is because that's the only one we have. It's basically the only one where we can see feedback at this level of detail, just ha because it happens to be a starburst that's very close by. Um, so anywhere else, it's much more difficult. Uh, but it is starting to be possible. Uh, so for instance, one of the ways, one of the most common ways you can do it is to look for blue-shifted absorption lines. So how does, what's the idea here? Essentially, the idea is you use the galaxy as a backlight, okay? So the galaxy light is a backlight. It's, it's coming to you, right? And um, the galaxy itself will do some absorption within a velocity range given by the rotation velocity of the galaxy, roughly, okay? So you will, it will absorb some of the light coming to you right, right in the galaxy uh, due to the gas in the galaxy. But sometimes you can see stuff like this. So you see, this is the galaxy redshift from the optical. This is what the absorption line looks like. So it looks here, but then it's very asymmetric. It's skewed all the way over here, right? So you imagine that, in fact, this part represents the, the rotation part, but we symmetrize it, so then it kind of looks like that, right? That's, that's the galaxy itself. And then all this stuff at, at higher velocities is then stuff that is moving towards us. It's blue shifted. Right, so it's being blown out of the galaxy up to, you know, in this case, you can see the galaxy is maybe only, you know, it's like a Milky Way-like thing. It's probably 200 kilometers per second. And then this thing goes up to like four or 500 kilometers per second, right? So, so that tells you that there's some extra component. It's really hard work to do this, right? You know, um, it's, it, you know, you have to look in these very, you know, uh, particular transition lines that are, that are, uh, that are both absorbed by the outflow as well as the galaxy, and then you know you have enough sensitivity to do all this. But it is possible, and there are uh, good measurements of this. So, for instance, this is doing this kind of uh, trick for magnesium two at redshift one uh, by ben, a study by Ben Wiener and company. And <clears throat> uh, effectively, what he's showing is the outflow velocity. Sorry, I got cut off there. It's stellar mass. Okay. So you can see that the outflow velocity, you know, increases slightly with stellar mass and is up the, up the order four or five hundred kilometers per second, which is off order of something like the escape velocity of something like the Milky Way, right? The rotation velocity is 200 kilometers per second, escape velocity is about double that, right? So it's four or five hundred kilometers per second. So this is telling you that, that basically at redshift one, we see these outflows happening, right? So that's very good. Um, it's also the case that we, we have, it's much more difficult to find outflows today uh, than, it is, than it is in early times. Uh, that's just because you know, there's, there's, the universe is denser and forming stars more quickly at early times, and so there's more supernovae. But the real difficulty with this is, yeah, you can measure the velocity by saying, uh, you know, okay, you know, this, thing, this outflow goes up to four or 500 kilometers per second, so I say that's the, that's the, that's the velocity of the outflow, the, the peak velocity of the outflow. The problem is the mass, right? Because I'm looking at this in one particular transition, this iron two line, right? Well, who the heck knows how that relates to the whole amount? I mean, most of it is obviously hydrogen, right? That's, that's not hydrogen. 
So now we have to start making a whole bunch of assumptions about the metallicity and how much of the iron is in this, this particular line and this and that, and it just gets incredibly good. So it's very hard to get the mass, uh, the mass outflow rate, right? Nonetheless, I'll show you in a, in a little while, it is, it is possible, right? Um, but what is sort of the, the implications of this? So, so we do observe these outflows, but <clears throat> in order to sort of understand, you know, to contextualize this, um, one of the most sort of instructive plots is this thing known, what's often commonly called the galaxy main sequence, okay? Um, so we heard about, you probably heard about the stellar main sequence, Galaxy people shamelessly borrowed that term. The stellar people hate us for it. Um, but but we, that's what we call it now. We call it the, the main sequence of galaxies, right? So what is that? So it's basically, um, you know, this is kind of a, a schematic, but it's actually not too bad in terms of uh, representing. What it is is essentially a, a essentially close to linear relationship between the star formation rate of galaxies and the stellar mass of galaxies. Now, maybe that's not so surprising in the end, right? If you have a bigger galaxy, you have more gravity that pulls more gas in, and therefore you have more star formation. So in a sense, that's not terribly surprising. Um, but what's cool about it is that the main sequence provides a reference point, right? So there's galaxies that lie above the main sequence. So they have high star formation rates for their stellar mass. We call those galaxies starbursts, right? Because that can't be, you know, Essentially, because it's a linear thing, and you know, the integral of star formation rate equals stellar mass, modulo some stellar evolution stuff, right? Um, you know, galaxies will, if left to themselves, will kind of evolve up along this relation, right? They'll grow in star formation rate, they'll grow in stellar mass, you know, everything will be sort of growing. In so if they're up here, right, they can't stay there for very long, right? Because if they were staying there for very long, you'd see a whole bunch of galaxies up here, but you don't. You, you, these are actually quite rare. So these must be excursions from the main sequence. Oftentimes, they're associated with mergers. Okay, we'll talk more about that next time. Um, so those are, those are the, the, the starburst galaxies. But then you also see these galaxies down here. So those are galaxies that lie off the main sequence, right? Um, and again, uh, this, this you know, has various names. So they have the, the really quenched elliptical galaxies. These are called red and dead. Uh, and then between the red sequence and the main sequence, the blue, the blue uh, galaxies, you have the green valley. Okay, um, so um, so that's that's again. This is what's interesting about the green valley. We won't go into too much into demographics. Is there's not many galaxies there, so it appears that things really go from the main sequence to the red and dead very quickly, um, which is another odd thing. We'll we'll talk about next time when we talk about quenching. Um, there's, you know, so this is, this is just some actual observations now, star formation rate versus stellar mass, binned observations over redshift, and something you notice, right? Okay, so this is just for reference slope of unity, and you can see that there has roughly a slope of unity at low masses, has a little turnover towards high masses, but particularly it evolves with time, right? So uh, the, the, at a given stellar mass, the star formation rate of galaxies is higher at early times. Why is that? Again, not that difficult to understand. The universe is denser, gas is flowing in faster, even for a given, uh, you know, it doesn't have as far to go uh, to fall in. So, so that's, that's the kind of observations you have. This is uh, some more observations at Redshift 2, for instance, and you see, you know, a variety of different kinds of galaxies, and we'll go into all the details, but you see these starburst galaxies, you know, this is the main sequence. This is four times the main sequence. You know, that's often used as a, as a delimiter for, star, for starburst, right? And then there's all these uh, things up here. This is what it looks like at redshift zero. Uh, in particular, um, this, it's, these points, or at least some of these points, are color-coded by gas fractions. So the underlying gray contours is the SDSS data. And you really see this bimodal galaxy population here, right? You see the main sequence here, and then you see the red and dead galaxies here, and there's very little in the green valley, hence the word valley, right? So it's very bimodal galaxy population, right? That, that gets established by redshift zero. And you can see it also in the H2. So the, the molecular hydrogen, which is, of course, the stuff that's fuel star formation, very high up here, really high up in the starburst. And then as you get down here, it's, it's not very high at all. That's why there's no star formation. So it all kind of hangs together. OK. So that's the main sequence. So one of the hopes initially was that, wow, this is great. If we can measure the main sequence, maybe we can learn something about feedback, right? 
a fail. Okay, why was it a fail? To first order, it's a fail. Well, the basic problem is this equation right here. The stellar mass is the integral of the star formation rate, minus some stellar mass loss, et cetera, et cetera. But you can account for that. That means if you say that, okay, my feedback is going to reduce star formation by some factor of you know, x, right? Well, your stellar mass then reduces by some factor of x, and you move down the relation, right? You don't move up or, ab up or above or below the relation, you move along the relation. So, so the main sequence to first order, you know, to, you can have some subtle effects, but to first order, the main sequence is, is a generic prediction of galaxy formation models. Um, and it, it's kind of insensitive to feedback. Very few things in galaxy formation are insensitive to feedback. This is one of them. Okay, the other thing that can sort of happen is that gas can go out, but it doesn't have to stay out, right? I mean, we saw in the movie that you can puff the gas up and then it comes back, right? This is something we called wind recycling, okay? We want to be very, you know, environmentally friendly here, right? So, so we want to recycle some of these winds. Um, in fact, wind recycling is incredibly important, right? Because if you think about it, um, particularly at late times, like you saw in that movie, right? That there's stuff coming in fresh, but there's also all this stuff that's just being blown out but not blown out enough to escape and is falling back in, right? And you can actually separate that in simulations and ask the question, you know, how much of the mass uh, is coming in in, in recycled form, how much of the stars are formed out of recycled, out of this cold mode. Uh, remember, we talked about these cold and hot halos, you know, whether the gas heats up to the virial temperature and cools down or doesn't. So this is cold mode where it doesn't, and this is hot mode. So we can split it up. This is this cosmic star formation history again. Uh, here's the redshift scale over here. Um, and then, you know, here's some model, this, this sort of dashed line where we split it up. And you can see the recycled gas is a huge fraction. Right? So a lot of, in fact, basically for something like the Milky Way, most of the gas that's coming in and forming stars today is stuff that was blown out from some galaxy, probably the Milky Way. Right? Um, so that's quite, quite interesting. It kind of makes you sort of think a little bit more about like, you know, a, 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 you know feedback in a, in a more holistic way. Um, yeah, I actually wanted to go here first. Oh, no, I did want to go there first. Okay. So... Okay, so then you ask, okay, fine, um, you know, if, if the main sequence isn't, isn't something that, that we can learn about feedback from, what about uh, the amount of gas So in galaxies? So this is another thing we can measure, right? We can go out and measure the atomic and molecular fractions in galaxies, right? So here's uh, a plot of the, in this case, this is the... Uh, uh, the total gas fraction, so H1 plus H2 versus stellar mass, right? And color-coded by what fraction is, is, is molecular, right? And so you see at low masses, you, see, you do see a lot of H1 at low masses here, right? All these blue points have a lot of H1, so a high uh, H1 to H2 ratio. But overall, it goes down with, uh, down with mass, right? Um, so is this sensitive to feedback? Well, not that much. Okay, um, so again, you can sort of see uh, in this in this uh, case, there's there. I ran a bunch of simulations where I turn winds on and off. If just focus on the green line and the blue line, this is the green line here. Uh, this is the simulation with these sort of supernova-driven winds, and the blue line is the one without. Now, here's an interesting thing that people often think: Oh, if I have winds, then I should have less gas because I'm blowing out a bunch of gas. In point of fact, I have more gas. Why, does wind why do winds create more gas at a given star mass? Hmm. Can anyone figure that out? Trick. Look at the denominator. Right? This is the gas mass divided by the stellar mass. We're actually not doing that much to the gas mass. What we're doing a lot to in the wind case is we're lowering the stellar mass because we're making the star formation more inefficient, right? So we lowered the denominator, which means we raised these gas fractions, okay? So, yeah, uh, just a fun little thing. Okay, so there's this kind of emerging paradigm. I guess it's not so emerging anymore. It's sort of, uh, there was a, a word invented uh, called the baryon cycle. Um, it was invented for the, you know, 2010 uh, decadal survey. 
um, by our panel. And what it basically says is that you know, the way to think about galaxy formation is not in terms of these kind of merger trees, the way we started off this lecture, talking about you know, galaxies with disks and merging into ellipticals and stuff. The way to think about galaxy formation is in this idea of a baryon cycle. What does that mean? That means that the galaxy growth is governed by a balance between these inflows being driven by gravity, the outflows that are being ejected by the star formation, and you know, whatever is left over in the middle forms in the star. So this is kind of the, the general scenario, right? You have a bunch of uh, filamentary structure, this kind of uh, uh, you know, very cartoonish picture here. You have, a bunch of, you have a filamentary structure that feeds a disk down here. The disk forms into stars, and then it blows some stuff out, and some of it recycles, right? Which then adds to the accreting gas and provides more fuel for star formation. Okay. So, uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, we'll go into the more detail on this, but essentially, uh, this kind of, you know, idea that there's this constant circulation of matter between galaxies and, and the CGM is, is very central to how we think about galaxy formation today, right? And it's, I think it's, a, it's quite a bit of a, a paradigm shift than the way I grew up, at least, with learning about galaxy formation. But it, it really puts... Um, you know, a lot of emphasis on this surrounding what we call circumgalactic gas, right? Because all this stuff, this outflows and recycling and inflows, all this stuff is happening in this circumgalactic gas. And all we can see, easily at least, is the few stars way down in the middle, right? So you look at a galaxy, you look at the image I showed you, the image you know, from JWST or whatever, galaxy, it looks like this beautiful, serene thing living out in the middle of nowhere with nothing going on, right? No, it's all kinds of craziness going on, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, can we think of a simple alternative model? Okay, so if this idea of this merger tree and disk smashing and forming into ellipticals doesn't work. Is there a way, is there another sort of simplistic way of envisioning galaxy formation without having to do a, you know, gargantuan simulation every time we want to think about galaxies, right? And the answer is yes. Um, and it's been uh, worked out by a number of uh, people, including uh, uh, our group. But the way I like to think about galaxies is essentially galaxies are gas processing factories, okay? So we have our little factory, okay? What is it doing? Well, the job of this factory is to take some inflow, right? And we're going to call this m dot grab is the is the is the mass inflow rate into the halo, driven uh, pulled in by gravity from the intergalactic medium. Now, not all of it makes it down into the galaxy, right? Because we've seen that you know some of it can shock heat and stay in a hot halo. You know, depends on the mass of the halo, so on and so forth. So let's let's invent this parameter zeta. I'm just going to call it parameter zeta, which can depend on mass, right? Doesn't have to be a constant. Can can be you know. Uh, and say that only zeta of it makes it into the factory. So the rest of it, you know, fell off the truck and got sold to, you know, someone's cousin, right? Okay, so, so then we get gamma, uh, or sorry, a zeta m dot grab there. So then you have some star formation that goes on in the galaxy, okay? So that gas gets processed into stars, and one of two things can happen, right? So a factory creates a product, but it also creates waste, right? The product here is stars, and the waste is the outflow. So the ratio between the outflow and the star formation is canonically denoted by this quantity uh, eta, which is co called the mass loading factor. So what, what multiple of the star formation rate is driven out in, in the outflow rate? Okay? Um, so again, you know, this is the thing that we need to be you know, factors of many in order to have that big suppression. Right? If we only want to form one part in 10 in, into stars and the rest, you know, we don't want to form into stars, we're going to need this eta to be around 10, rough, you know, just very roughly, right? Neglecting any preventive, you know, velvet rope type feedback, but just to give you more intuition. So that means that of this stuff, 1 over 1 plus eta forms into stars and eta to over 1 plus eta forms into, uh, it goes into the outflow, right? But of course, we have an environmentally friendly factory, so we... We recycle as much waste as we can, right? So there is some recycling that goes on, and that adds to this, um, to this uh, gravitational inflow, right? And, you know, there, there are many ways to parameterize this. One way to parameterize is using a recycling time. So let's say, you know, 
what is the typical time that once you eject a material, it stays out? And again, this might depend on mass, redshift, all kinds of things, right? But if we just write down from this what the star formation rate is, right? Just from this simple mathematics of mass. Effectively, this is mass balance, right? We're doing nothing more than just following mass, masses, how much mass is going into various things. So then you have m dot grab plus m dot recycling. You have this zeta is multiplying that. You know, that's once it goes into recycling, it's back in the halo, so it's subject to the same sort of suppression. And then you divide that by one plus eta, right? And that's your star formation rate. And you have sort of three parameters associated with this model. Uh, this is this zeta, this maybe something like recycling time, some way to parameterize this, and this eta, which is the mass loading factor. So that's actually relatively simple, right? And it actually captures a lot of what's going on uh, in simulation, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, we call these baryon cycling parameters. Now, I've talked to you a couple of things. You know, the main sequence wasn't that sensitive to outflows. The, the, you know, the gas fraction, somewhat sensitive to outflows. I'll tell you what is really sensitive to outflows, metals, okay? Why? Because metals are directly produced in these supernovae. The same things that are blowing up everything and, and you know, sending stuff everywhere, right? So we have a very clear tracer of what gas has been, you know, blown out from a supernovae. That stuff's going to be enriched, whereas the stuff coming in first time from the IGM is not going to be enriched, right? So it's a very clear distinction. So in point of fact, we can actually also compute the metallicity in this type of simplistic model, okay? So the pristine grass is accreted. Let's assume the m dot grav is, has zero metals. It's not really true, but let's just keep it simple. The stars then form to make the metals, and the enriched ISM is then blown out, right? So what does that mean? So essentially, the metallicity is going to be how much star formation you have. By metallicity, what I mean is the mass fraction in metals, OK, is going to be the, the amount of star formation you have times this quantity called the yield, which is the mass fraction of metals created per unit star formation. Okay? And this is a number that the supernova theorists and stuff can tell us. It happens to be right around uh, the, the, the solar metallicity of around 2%, give or take a factor of 2. Okay? Um, <clears throat> this term does not have the recycled inflow because the recycled stuff is already enriched. Remember? So it doesn't need to be further enriched. You only need to enrich the, the stuff that's, that's coming in for the first time. Um, so again, we have the inflow is equal to star formation rate plus outflow. So that means that, uh, again, you know, just rewriting it in terms of this eta parameter, that's 1 plus eta times star formation, right? So this is your m dot grav, which means that I can solve for this, put, put you know, z solar in for y, put this in for uh, star formation rate, the m dot graph, uh, sorry, the star formation rate cancels out here on the, on the denominator or the numerator, and that uh, leaves you with a very simple equation, which is the metallicity of galaxies is basically something like the solar metallicity over 1 plus eta, right? So if we can measure, let's say, the metallicity of galaxies versus mass, right, that, you know, this is, this is just a number, right? This is our solar metallicity of the sun we can actually measure eta as a function of mass. That's pretty amazing. Does it actually work? Well, let's see. So this is the mass-metallicity relation. It's remarkably one of the tightest relations in extragalactic astronomy. At a given stellar mass, galaxies have a metallicity you know, with a dispersion of like 0.1 dex. Right? So within, given your stellar mass, you can, you can t I can tell you for a star-forming galaxy what its metallicity is to within 0.1 dex. It's pretty incredible. Nothing else is that tight, really. You can sort of see it here. So this is, this is an observations of the mass-metallicity relation using this um, particular way of doing it. Uh, so in this case, this is uh, measuring the oxygen abundance. Okay? Uh, so this is the oxygen abundance versus stellar mass. There's these funky units called 12 plus, I hate this, but anyway, this is what people do. The important thing to know is that the solar value in this case, and people argue about this too, is around 8.7, okay? So that's the metallicity of the sun. This is the observations, the black points here, right? Um, what this paper claims is a, the most reliable way to do it. Uh, there are, unfortunately, a number of different ways to measure the metallicity, and 
no two of them agree. <laughs> so this just gives you an idea of the, the spread. Uh, and this is all you know, using similar data, but uh, just using a different calibrators and different indices and different ways that people have measured the metallicity. Because you measure it from oxygen lines, you can measure it from nitrogen lines, you can measure it from you know, some other various types of features, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a big mess. Nonetheless, what's, you know, that's mostly a change in the amplitude. The slope is actually pretty independent of stuff. Okay, so that's, that's so you see, what is, what, is this, what is this telling you? So let's particularly look at this part of the curve here. If you go measure that slope, right, the data shows that the, the, the metallicity is about the solar metallicity, so this, remember, it kind of asymptotes to the solar value, at around maybe like 10 to the 10 solar masses, right? So it's M star over 10 to the 10 solar masses, and that slope is about 0.3, right? And that, in our simple model, has to equal, again, solar metallicity divided by 1 plus eta, right? So that's an easy thing to solve, right? Boom, here you go. That eta is equal to M star over 10 to the 10 to the power minus 0.3. All right. In other words, eta is inversely proportional to the stellar mass, which is good. We want high mass outflow rates at low stellar masses. We want to get rid of more stuff, suppress more star formation, right? So that's good. Uh, and then, of course, it has to kind of go to zero effectively, you know, at, at very high masses, right? Um, in fact, I told you that it's very difficult to measure mass outflow rates, but people are doing it. Uh, this is a compilation from uh, Egan et al. Actually, they were, work they were working on this very low mass system. Um, don't worry about too much what all these, you know, where all these come from, but, but essentially, you know, you have to make a lot of assumptions, but this is a variety of data points measuring uh, the mass loading factor in galaxies, right? These black points are, are some simulations up here, as, and the shaded region is also some simulations. This is the equilibrium model. The, this model that we just presented, okay, kind of goes right there, right? So, you know, just from looking at the mass metallicity relation, you can, you can get a lot of information. And in fact, it even shows up in simulations, right? So this it works exactly the same in simulations. So this, for instance, is the mass metallicity relation from some simulations, which, you know, maybe you can make this plot in your, uh, 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 you know, whatever hands-on activity. What happens if I turn off feedback altogether Sure enough, there's the eta is zero, right? By definition, there's no, there's no outflows, so the thing should be a constant. And sure enough, it is, right? And when we put in all the feedback that gets all the galaxies right at all, and et cetera, it, it kind of does that, and these data points are these sort of hashy things. So, so the metallicity is a very important tracer of, of feedback, and it's one of the most interesting things uh, that you can measure. Um, this sort of simple model is, is nice because it kind of, you know, okay, it's very, you know, it's very crude and there's a lot of missing physics here. But it still gives you some interesting insights. And one of the things you can do, for instance, is to do a big MCMC and constrain it to a bunch of observations and then see what kind of, what that implies for these, for these baryon cycling parameters. Because that'll give you some intuition as to how galaxy formation works, right? So it's kind of intuitive. And this is what we did. So this, this basically is the constraints. Don't worry about that. It, you know, just showing that the model goes through the data. The data is all the red points here. Um, but this is the interesting thing. So here's the mass loading factor. Here's this wind recycling time. And here's this zeta parameter, this, this preventive feedback, the how, much, how much gets lost, right? As a function of halo mass and as a function of stellar mass. So a couple of interesting things here. This is your... You know, this is your, uh, uh, um, you know, eta goes, goes, in this case, to about minus 0.5 of stellar mass uh, and then drops off towards zero. Uh, again, the wind recycling, low mass galaxies tend to lose their stuff for a long time. Maybe not surprising, they, they don't have as much gravity to pull things back. A high mass galaxies, right, this is giga years. So, you know, something like a 10 to the 10 solar mass galaxy will, will only push out their galaxy for t today for something like a year, right? And then it'll fall back in. So you can't keep star formation out forever, right? Um, and then this zeta thing is pretty interesting. If you look at this plot in particular, right? It has a very sharp cutoff at low masses and a pretty sharp cutoff at high masses. We kind of saw that, we kind of knew this had to happen from the shape of that, of that you know, cosmic efficiency curve, right? We had to suppress things at low masses and suppress things at high masses, right? 
This comes from reionization. We won't talk about that too much. This comes from some sort of, you know, AGN feedback or something like this, which we'll talk about next time. But the point is this. Galaxy formation is only efficient in a very small range of halo masses, between about 10 to the 10 and 10 to the 12. It's sort of dwarfed to, to, to kind of L star galaxies. Everywhere else, galaxy formation has to be really, has to be much, much less efficient for whatever reason. Yeah. Ah, uh, sorry, this is versus stellar mass and this is versus halo mass. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, this, this, this I think, and you know, we're assuming these are power laws, that's why they look like power laws. So that's, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, you can sort of, uh, um, you know, think about, um, you know, get some intuition on how, you know, how and where galaxies are forming. So in the last couple of slides, what I wanted to talk about was mergers. Okay, so so far, rather amazingly, We've developed this whole formalism with baryon cycling. We haven't once talked about mergers. Remember, we started off talking about halo mergers and mergers do this and mergers you know, turn this into that and all that. I never talked about mergers. So what are mergers? Do mergers do anything? Right? Should we care about mergers? Well, yes, but I'm going to argue that they're actually a second order effect. Okay? So the point is this. Dark matter growth, you know, in fact, that m dot grab term is not a smooth, sort of, you know, continuous, nice, you know, steady hose, right? It's lumpy. You know, as these filaments form, galaxies form in the filaments, and they brought, got brought in, and they're all mergers, right? So, therefore, you know, because dark matter growth is lumpy, the, fluctuate, the, the accretion rate into the halo, that m dot grab, is actually variable. And that's plotted here, right? So this is the accretion rate versus halo mass. Um, and this, these black points are just individual uh, halos, right? How much is being accreted at any given time. And you can see it's very skewed. So the typical median value is down here. This is kind of the average value. And it's very sort of highly skewed, has a big tail towards mergers. So these things are the big mergers up here, right? Where you've, where you've in a short amount of time, you've gained a, a huge amount of mass. Um, and they are rare, but they, are, they're sort of, uh, they do happen. Right? But in this kind of scenario, this, this kind of um, you know, uh, simplistic model, you get all the merger is is effectively a large inflow fluctuation. That's all it is. Right? You, you suddenly have a bunch more gas. It's fairly rare. Um, so I'll, we'll get to the measuring the inflow fluctuations, but I just want to make the point that both in observations and in models, we, we, and this is, I think, a bit of a surprise to people 10 years ago when they, when they first realized this, the, the amount of stars forming in mergers is actually a really small fraction over cosmic time. Um, and that was a surprise because people sort of, you know, always thought of galaxy mergers as driving everything, right, in the old school way of thinking about things. Disrupt that, yeah, yeah. So that, that's going to be, you know, when we talk about morphology and particularly AGN, it's, the merger is going to play a much bigger role next, in next lecture on Wednesday. But for, for just for growing galaxies, pretty small. And you can see that in observations. So this is, for instance, uh, the fraction of the, the star formation rate uh, as a function of star, uh, stellar mass occurring in starbursts, which are typically driven by mergers. And you see the numbers. They're like less than 10%, right? And these are various, you know, simulations or whatever. Uh, this is uh, the cosmic, again, this Madau plot, this cosmic star formation history of, uh, you know, star formation rate density versus redshift. This is uh, the Horizon AGN simulation, just one particular simulation that uh, these folks did. Uh, these is some observations. That's very nice. But, of course, in a simulation, you can go in and say exactly how much of that occurred in mergers, right? Um, and that's that line down here. And then you can split it up into minor mergers or major mergers, which are sort of the above 10 to, you know, 4 to 1 or below 4 to 1, right? And you see it's very small, right? So that's, I think, you know, one of the, one of the key messages and one of the key reasons why this whole baryon cycling picture is, is sort of taken off because, you know, people realize that it's not the mergers that are doing stuff, right? They, they do some stuff, but in terms of if you just grow galaxies, the mergers are not that important. So the last thing is this. It's like, can we, okay, fine. So mergers aren't that important globally, but they're still interesting, right? They can still do stuff, right? In particular, 
I said that, for instance, the mass metallicity relation has a very small scatter. I was very proud of that, right? It's only 0.1 dec. But the fact is, it's not only that it has a very small scatter, but it's that scatter is actually correlated. It's weird. Okay. So it seems weird. So this is um, the mass metallicity relation again, the same thing I just showed you, except now what they've done is they've split it into bins of specific star formation rate. In other words, specific star formation rate, it's star formation rate per stellar mass. So how, how quickly is it adding stars? So a, a thing that has a large specific star formation rate is a starburst, so it has a large star formation, it's over the main sequence, right? So effectively, you can think about this as a, a distance to the main sequence, right? If you're above or below the main sequence. And what you notice is that the mass metallicity relation, right, below, so they've kind of, they made the blue thing below the main sequence, minus here, right? So things that lie below the main sequence tend to have high metallicity, and things that lie above the main sequence tend to lie on a relation that's below the metallicity, the, the typical metallicity. So there's a very strong correlation here. And it also appears, you know, if you, uh, uh, you know, do it versus, let's say, H1 bass, right? In this case, basically, low uh, H1 mass seem to lie at high metallicity, and high H1 mass seem to lie at low metallicity relative to the, uh, uh, you know, the typical. So, um, so what is that? Can we understand that in this baryon cycling picture? And the answer is yes. Uh, so when this verse was first published, everybody was very surprised. Uh, uh, and then, you know, well, in fact, it had already been published why this is the case and, and predicted, but of course they didn't. Uh, uh, necessarily pay attention, but, but what happens here? Let's think about it. Okay, here's your mass metallicity relation in the simulation, okay? So what happens if a merger happens? So uh, suddenly, you're sitting around minding your own business. Here comes this big lump of gas, okay, with a little bit of stars in there. It has lower metallicity because it's a lower mass object, and it merges into you. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to gain a little bit of stars, but you're also going to go down in metallicity. Maybe I've exaggerated things a little bit here, but just for effect, you're going to go down in metallicity and gain a little bit of stars, right? So you're going to move in this direction. Well, as that happens, you've also received a whole bunch of fresh fuel for star formation at the same time. So that's going to make these galaxies a lot more star forming than you know, what you would normally see. And that's exactly what we see here, right? The galaxies that lie below the mass metallicity relation are, high, are more star forming. Okay, so you get that big lump, right? And then you ask the question, you know, what, what happens after that? Like the galaxy, okay, now it, it's started forming stars and stuff. Well, what's going to happen, right, is that as the star formation proceeds, it's going to form proportionally, going to form sta stars, and at the same time, in the same proportion, it's going to form metals. Right, because essentially that you know the same thing that's it's forming stars and metals at the same time. So this is now going to move in a one-to-one -one relation along a slope of unity, right? So it's going to move start moving back towards the line with a slope of unity. Now remember this was a slope of minus 0.3, or sorry, 0.3, right? So unity is a lot steeper than that. So very quickly you rejoin the mass metallicity relation, right? So in fact, you can sort of plot this, you can you can track galaxies and simulations, and what they do is they kind of oscillate around the mass metallicity relation, right? And so effectively, these, these relations, and this is also true of the gas relation, so again, things that are, you know, below, uh, you know, that have low gas fractions, you know, are, are less star forming, right? Same sort of idea. This is all this idea of sort of this equilibrium, like galaxies like to live in these equilibria along these particular scaling relations that's set by some combination of mean inflows and outflows and all that. And then when they're disturbed, when why, why we call it in equilibrium, is when they're disturbed away from it, the processes tend to conspire to move it back towards those relations, right? As long as they remain star forming. Once they stop star forming, you know, then basically once you stop accretion, then these things move off the relation because they, again, this form goes up linearly, right? It just forms metals, but it never receives any fresh low metallicity gas, and it ends up up here, right? So things that are quenched, galaxies, uh, like satellites and stuff like that, tend to live above the mass metallicity relation. So 
So this is, this is the way that, that mergers kind of factor into these kind of scaling relations, but it gives you a very good intuition about you know, this idea that galaxies like to live around, the, around these equilibria, and then they're perturbed off of that, and because of the way that the baryon cycling processes work, they tend to move back towards these relations as long as they're star forming. Okay, so that's, that's what I wanted to cover in, in this lecture. Um, yeah, so again, you know, they form and evolve within halos. There are these cold mode and hot mode uh, situations, uh, halos, uh, and, you know, we have these overcooling problem and also the angular momentum problem, which is generally the people with pretty much every model this day solves it, you know, using some kind of uh, energetic feedback. Uh, and, you know, supernovae is, is the typical uh, ejective feedback, but it can also be preventive because it can also heat the gas as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, exactly how all this works is basically the absolute frontier of galaxy formation today, right? Is trying to figure out how do these supernovae drive the gas out or, or stellar formation? Uh, what happens to that gas? You know, uh, how the energy is coupled? Does it heat? Does it, does it cool? Uh, and how does all that work within? And the problem is you have to do it within all this growing large-scale structure. Otherwise, you know, you can't, um, you can't look at it as sort of an isolated problem. Uh, and then you have these mergers causing these second-order deviations off these equilibrium relations. So um, the next time, of course, we're going to start talking. So, so far, we've dealt with the low half end of the cosmic star formation efficiency. Now we're going to have to worry about the high mass end. And for that, suddenly things like mergers and black holes and all these other things we haven't talked about yet are going to become pretty important. Uh, so I'll stop there. Okay, so do we have questions here? By the way, these supernovas are typically type 2, type 1A? What is the... Uh, these are the, the type 2s. Type 2s um, usually, right? Yeah, type 2s by far dominate the energy budget, the energy of, su budget. of supernovae. They're not the most common, but the energy is... Uh, they are the most common. Uh, supernova 1A are, are actually are fairly rare. rare. Okay. Uh, that's why... So they're more common and more energetic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering, how do we estimate the the height of uh, stars forming and the uh, stars existing in a galaxy? Ah, right. So how do we measure the stellar mass, are you saying? Or yeah, no, the, st uh, the stellar mass, mass and the rate of forming galaxies. And the star formation rate, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah okay. So I, I, I didn't tell you those things. That is true. Uh, uh, so... The answer is many different ways, and none of them are totally right. <laughs> but the basic idea is that um, you know you get essentially a, a, a spectrum of a galaxy, right? So, as a function of lambda, you get um, you know the the, the flux, uh, and galaxies typically look something like this. Okay, I'll, I'll try to draw it. Um, so I'll, I'll try to draw several different galaxies. So. First, I'll draw some key wavelengths here. So this is, let's say, 12, 16 angstroms. So this is very far into the ultraviolet. This is sort of, let's say, 4,000 angstroms here. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, blue. Uh, then this, let's call about a 7,000 angstroms. So this would be, for those of you who know, this is optical R-band. Uh, and then this is sort of, let's say, one micron. Um, so that's the, that's the, you know, starting to be near infrared. Right? So galaxies, you know, there's too much neutral hydrogen, so they don't really have much light there. And then uh, you have a bunch of light here, uh, but this light is often, um, you know, extincted by dust and stuff like that. Then you have another, another little jump here at around 4,000 angstroms, and then you have a, a spectrum that looks like that. Okay, so this is what a, you know, very typical, like Milky Way-like galaxy uh, will, will look like. That bump is probably too exaggerated, okay. So <clears throat> on top of that, there's gonna be a few emission lines. So like for instance, H alpha, and there's gonna be, you know, uh, actually H alpha is here, H, H beta, oxygen three, some other emission lines are gonna be on top of that, right? So there's several ways to measure the star formation weight. One is from these emission lines. What these emission lines are, are effectively, there's young stars trapped within nebula of gas, you know, that when which they formed, they're exciting that nebula 
with these energetic emission lines, and so it's effectively a calorimeter for how much energy is coming out of the young stars, and you can translate that into an amount of stars formed. The other way to do it is to uh, essentially uh, try to measure something, some characteristics of the spectrum. Um, so uh, some of those characteristics indicate are indicated by the slope of this, this, this blue light, because remember, the young stars have a lot of ultraviolet light, right? So, uh, so you know, if you have a very young galaxy, it will look more like this, right? You'll get a huge amount of ultraviolet light. The problem with this is there's is a degeneracy. There's this, this is the famous uh, age uh, dust or age metallicity degeneracy, right? So you can have a young galaxy that's that has a lot of young stars, but also has a lot of dust. Dust tends to get rid of the UV light, right? Same reason sunsets are red, right? Not quite. That's really scattering. But anyway, it's close, right? Um, so. So, uh, you know, so you see something like this, you don't a priori know whether it's dusty, or the highly star forming and dusty, or, you know, old and not dusty, right? Uh, the one thing is, if you had way out in the far infrared, way out here, that dust tends to reprocess light and create a whole bunch of... So if you manage to have access to this, then it becomes very obvious, but that's hard, right? Um, Otherwise, you look for, you know, kind of the slope, this, the, the slope of this makes it different. Uh, the real problem is, of course, you don't really have spectra. In a lot of cases, all you have is a few photometric points like this, right? And then you basically have to start fitting models. And this is a process known as SED fitting. Uh, and so you have huge libraries of models, and you say, can I, you know, and I input, you know, some range of star formation rates, star mass to scan over, and I try to do something to best fit this data points. But that can have a lot of degeneracies as well, but that's the best you can do. So that gives you, that kind of thing gives you, you know, the star formation rate, the, the stellar metal, the stellar mass, uh, and a bunch of other things, gives you the age, uh, gives you the dust content, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Any other questions? Uh, can I? In the meantime. Yes. Uh, I was expecting the central black holes play a role, but you're telling us they don't. Not in, not in star-forming galaxies. For one thing, they're very small. Okay. Like, you know, what's a four million solar mass black hole going to do in something like the Milky Way? Damn near nothing, right? Um, so, yeah, they, they essentially play no role at all. Um, I wouldn't say zero role. Uh, you know, they may add some energy during their, you know, like Seifert phase or something like that. But, um, you know, I think, you know, people always think black holes, wow, so much gravity, energy. Effect. Black holes are tiny, right? They're really tiny in the galaxy, right? Uh, and, and so they, they really have to be doing something spectacular to, to affect the galaxy, which they do at high masses. But so far, we've been talking a little about the low mass end. So maybe for the benefits of the students here, we, we've heard many, uh, we heard previous talks about, you know, um, how stars form in different places and in right. different ways. We are also going to have a course here on galactic archaeology. So mm. perhaps you could say something about, is there the picture about the competition between code accretion and, and also uh, mergers, also feedback, mm. do that? Okay, so maybe for the entire star formation rate, you have, um, you have these equilibria, in, et cetera. But when I look at in details at the different uh, areas of the galaxy, yeah. the thick disk, thin disk, the poge, and the bar, can we see imp uh, an imprints of those different models in yeah. those populations? Because we're going to start tomorrow hearing from, for instance, from Christina about the different ways in which the different populations of stars have different ages, metallicity, and so inside the galaxy. Is this yeah. something that you can kind of link to models? Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting results, I don't know if Christina will talk about this, but it, it appears that, um, for instance, this fundamental metallicity relation, it's not just on a galaxy-wide scale. You can, you can look at it, you know, in Khalifa, for instance, uh, in patches of the galaxy, and it, you still see this sort of thing, right? Um, so... Uh, so it does seem to be a very sort of, you know, uh, endemic way of thinking about 
uh, what, you know, how stars form over sufficiently large patches. I mean, you get down to individual star levels, okay, everything goes haywire. But, uh, but it, overall, you know, if you can average over a significant portion of stars, you know, I think this kind of idea of mass balance and this idea that you're blowing some of the stuff out and you're accreting some stuff and then, you know, you, you have all these processes going on, this energy is released. You know, that's, that I think is going on at a smaller scale than the, even the whole galaxy, right? So it becomes quite interesting to think about things like, um, you know, what are the, the metallicity gradients in this type of a scenario, right, uh, in, in that you see in galaxies. And you can make, you know, some simple models of this. Are there, you know, I gave you a super simple model. There's more complicated models that account for the gas contents and things like that, so-called gas regulator models, et cetera. Um, and they try to do more sophisticated things uh, like that. But, uh, but, you know, just for intuition, I was trying to present something simple. But, but yeah, uh, I think it's sort of a handy way to think about the global, how the global connects to the small scale, basically, is it, right? Uh, if uh, we have uh, the colors of, of a galaxy and the red shift, can we, I mean, maybe using machine learning, estimate the star formation rate? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, the colors, uh, it depends on how many colors you have. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, one of the... Like six? Yeah, no, I mean, if you five, have six okay. bands, right, it effectively becomes, well, it's, that's kind of like SED fitting with using machine learning rather than trying to uh. do a parameter space search for models, right? Uh, which there have been some, some papers on that, um, that that have tried to do that. Um, and, and I think it is actually fairly promising. Um, but the problem is, you know, as with any machine learning thing, it's only as good as your training set. Uh, and then the problem is if your training models are... And the pro so, you know, I made it seem very simple that, oh, we just have this set of models and magically you can just fit everything. Well, whose models? Well, it turns out there's a whole different bunch of sets of models and everybody argues about what should go into these models, right? Because star formation itself is not a solved problem, right? So you have the B-PASS models, you have the bourgeois charlot models, you have the, you know, FSBS models, all kinds of different models, right? And they all use different stellar libraries and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't think machine learning would be... Would, it might be nice because it kind of goes from A to B directly rather than, you know, having to go through all this craziness. Uh, but, yeah, it's ultimately, I suspect, it's going to be limited by the same thing, which is our understanding of, of the details of stellar evolution. Okay. Well, we, okay, if we don't have more questions, then we break now for the coffee. Thanks from you again. And uh, we'll be back here in half an hour after coffee for the hands-on session. And uh, let's see here if 